Well, hello wherever you are. I'm Gordy Little with the Hometown Cable Cameras. On a rather cool but not so bad December 11th, 2012, it's almost Christmas time, as you can tell. We're in front of the 1812 Museum, the History Shop and Interpretive Center, operated by the Battle of Plattsburgh Association and part of a museum campus which we have going for us on the former Plattsburgh Air Force Base. And why are we here on a December day? Well, because we have an outdoor encampment. And who would want to camp outside during this time of the year? Well, we and actors, that's who, and they love to do it. And we're talking about Pike's Cantonment. The Pike's Cantonment was here in Plattsburgh over the fall of uh, 1812 into 1813 was eventually burned down and it was lost for a while until our good friend and president of the Plattsburgh uh, Battle of Plattsburgh Association found it a few years ago. So they're commemorating Pike's Cantonment with the third annual camp and you can see one of the tents between those two buildings behind what used to be the interpretive center across the road Washington Avenue here in the former base. You can almost see the top of Santa Claus's head in front of that old Air Force place, uh, plane, I should say, right along Route 3, just on the south end of Plattsburgh. We're going to talk to some of the people and find out what this encampment is all about as you look at the British flag in the background. I have uh, my own uh, camera here today as uh, Calvin Castine is elsewhere with hometown cable cameras so you won't see much of my face and that'll be a tremendous relief for most of our viewers as we check out the encampment the third annual encampment for Pike's Cantonment on the former Plattsburgh Air Force Base. I showed you the encampment from a distance and now I'm going to approach it not too stealthily because any of you who've seen the size of my body knows it'd be very hard for me to sneak in anywhere. But I'm coming here to look at the people whose ears don't look too frozen. And I'll bet you they are delighted that they weren't here like uh, three or four nights ago when the temperature was zero or below. Because on this December 11th, for the third annual encampment, there is no snow on the ground. And it's not because these toasty campfires have melted at all. We just got lucky. But I have to tell you, I've been looking at the weather map from the Midwest for the last day or so. There is a storm coming in here. And these are the best planners in the world, these reenactors, you know. They're going to be out of here before the big storm hits tomorrow night. And won't that be a great idea? Yeah, yeah look, at, look at who we're approaching. You see this guy with the cool hat on? <laughs> hey, Gordy, how you hey, doing? Hey, Josh Wiggler, how are you? Good, thanks for coming out today. I don't look at all like Calvin Castine, do I? Yeah. This can't be the third <laughs> annual encampment. You know, it is. It's the third time. It, this is the biggest one we've done. We even had an audience today to watch the battle. No. It wasn't a big one, but it was It was an audience. I was talking on Skype with my kids and... and and uh, down in Ohio, I was going to be here for 1 o'clock, but I missed it. Maybe I'll come back for the next one tomorrow. Ah, you've seen one, you've seen them all. Oh, really? <laughs> you've seen one dead soldier, you've seen them all? Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, you come back later on tonight, you might see some more dead soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll be, maybe laying on the ground. I think I, may, I think I may have killed a few of those dead soldiers myself over the years, but that may be a topic that won't be covered in this particular show today. <laughs> <laughs> what a motley crew this is. Have I ever saw a motley crew? Josh, tell us a little bit about Pike's Cantonment and why we're here this weekend. Well, we actually have one of the Pike's Cantonment experts over here, Tom Bray. Oh, and, Tom, um, my friend Tommy Bray. He, he's an expert on so many things. Well, the, the gist of what we're doing this weekend is that in the, the summer of 1814, wars declared and suddenly the the trade and all with Canada, which had been the lifeblood of the communities up here, it goes from being good business to being smuggling. And uh, the army was sent up here, uh, part of an invasion to attack and uh, capture Montreal. Well, they just barely made it over the border, and if you know where Le Col is, that's as far as they made it. 
So the army comes back to Plattsburgh. Part of it sends uh, is sent over to Burlington. Another part is staying here to winter. They end out some three miles outside of the town on the Saranac because the townies don't want the, the soldiers in town causing a problem. So you got all these guys stuck out in the wilderness with a handful of canvas tents, uh, and uh, they were forced to build. They had to build their own housing. <laughs> In fact, uh, the general of Dearborn that was in charge here went and wintered in Albany for the, the winter. So, the army stuck here. They're trying to build uh, in this temperature down here. It wasn't until about Christmas that they start getting their huts built. So they're actually inside. Uh, Captain John Scott of the 15th talks about setting his blanket down underneath a tree, and that's where he slept in December. <laughs> Think about so, that for a moment. So you got the army up here, and then you got the smuggling going on, and it actually got so bad that uh, Colonel Pike, that was in charge of the encampment, put a uh, he actually printed the proclamate or the uh, articles of war in the newspaper, the Plattsburgh paper, where it talks about how smuggling was punishable by death, and that anyone that caught could be uh, would be subject to military justice and all this stuff. So you had the soldiers that were up here, and they're trying to capture people at the border, and and uh, meanwhile. They're freezing and dying by droves in the encampment. Actually, by the, the spring of 1813, 10% uh, of the soldiers that were here had died. Over t uh, 200 men out of the 2,000 that were here. So it was quite a time, wasn't it? Well, you know, it's easy today, today for us to, uh, to kind of uh, forget the kind of hardships that uh, people endured. Especially when we've got all our modern heat and our snow plows and, and man-made fibers, what people had to endure just a, a few short years ago. Well, we, you know, we talk about Valley Forge and how tough that was. Even before that, Tommy plays Nottingham. Actually, get over, hey, John, get over here a minute, Tom. You got your blanket? Hold up your blanket. Oh, wait a minute. Oh. Right there. John's got a blanket? Yeah, well, the I always had a blanket. <laughs> well, the official blanket. See, in the wintertime, I call we, mine my blanket. Call and uh, they were issued uh, a blanket by purveyors for the Army. And they were three by four feet. This that's not, this that's is not big enough for my shoulders. I don't know about yours. That's right. This is, this is what they were issued to stay warm in the wintertime, if you can believe <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Actually, it's probably criminal, but uh, I don't think it would be far apart charge. And to think that blanket, unlike him, is almost 200 years old. <laughs> yeah. no. Almost, yeah. sir. You know, I, w I was thinking about that this morning, Thomas. Yes, sir. How uh, close we are getting to uh, the 200th anniversary of 1812 and then 1814. We started talking about the Battle of Plattsburgh 100 million years ago. It <laughs> seems like, God, I hope we can lived that long and Calvin and I for hometown cable wondering who was going to push who in the wheelbarrow with the camera when that time arrived but I think we're going to make it now don't you Tom? I hope so we were talking about it this morning and, and everybody was saying well I'm going to be 40 this or I'm going to be 50 that and I'm going to be, I'm going to be in my 60s <laughs> I'll still you try can make it and you'll never catch me as long as you live I'll still try to make it you know we've, we've seen you under many circumstances <laughs> we've frozen our ears at Point of Fair and who knows where all <laughs> in the fields at behind Praise Market <laughs> in Keysville, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You had history in your bones the moment you were born. I mean, you can't remember when you didn't have a passion for this stuff, can you? No, I can't. I just, I, I've i always grown up liking history. It was probably one of my best subjects in school. And it's just it's just grown and grown and grown. And, and over the years, with meeting everybody else in all these different avenues of, of history and reenacting, I find that I get caught up in it even more. As you can see, we're doing Pike's Cantonment. Yep. And I'm standing here in a, in a British uniform because somebody had to be the other side. Um, we're talking 1812, a winter camp, like Josh said, and it, it gets overlooked because everybody just goes, oh, it was just a campground, but you don't realize that there were patrols going out all the time, and that Pike sent men up to Champlain, and they were actually skirmishing along the borders. There was a lot going on that was involved with, with these three regiments that were here. We're talking about uh, the same Pike that uh, for whom Pike's Cantonment was named and for whom Pike's Peak was named. Yes, sir. Yeah. I was talking with one of my kids who uh, lives down in Ohio and Kentucky this morning, and I said we were coming to the encampment commemorating Pike's Cantonment, and he said, I never heard of that, but I've heard of Pike's Peak. I said, same guy. Same guy. He was there earlier. He had gone out to explore. 
Um, actually, it's considered a spy mission that he was he was gone um, into the Spanish territories. Um, Pike is also involved uh, with a few other guys later on. Uh, Wilkinson. Oh yeah. And um, uh, Burr. And it, actually, by Pike not testifying, they they didn't hang. Isn't that uh, he amazing? knew more about them than than uh, he revealed. You know, I want to talk a little bit more about Pike's Contonement itself because even though people may be relatively new fans of these, this wonderful museum complex we have and the things that you and I have talked about before, Pike's Contonement is, is sometimes in history one of those nebulous things. As a matter of fact, we lost the sight of it for a few years until our good friend Keith Herculo helped us locate it. But it wasn't, uh, uh, you know, after once they got the buildings built, it was sizable. Oh, yes. I, I, I'm sure some people don't even know what the word cantonment means. Well, the con a, a cantonment is, is, a, is a campground, and you're talking three regiments. Three regiments of about f uh, 500 men per regiment. So there's 1,500 men right there. You've got the 6th, the 15th, and the 16th regiment. But Colonel Pike also had artificers. Those are your carpenters, your engineers. He had uh, two companies of artillery. Um, fortunately for them, they got to camp in barns, uh, Peter Saley's barns in town here. But the rest of them are three miles out there um, in the pine forest uh, until they pretty much clear it. Um, they get there in November and, and they build until they leave um, basically the first of April. But they don't get into those barracks till like the end of February. Think about it. Because you can you can get from Clements Library in Michigan, uh, Pike's correspondent from the cantonment, where day by day um, it tells you when the barracks was built, who built it, who put the who put the fireplaces up, um, how much the wood costs, and everything. A lot of activity going on out there. It was a busy place, as you said, with a lot of people, and then. It, uh, it suffered from a fiery demise, if you will, Thomas. Tell me about that. Well, that's when Colonel Murray, when, uh, when Colonel Pike is out there, he writes to Congress and says, um, don't send us west, because if you send us west, the first thing the British are going to do is come down and invade Plattsburgh. And his, his um, premonition comes, comes true. Uh, that's a, that's another important thing about the cantonment that's out that's out there. You've got you've got that amount of men out there in that campground, actually keeping the British from coming down. Um, and when they leave, Colonel Murray comes down and raids Plattsburgh, burns the cantonment, burns a lot of the buildings in town, and runs off with a lot of goods. So Pike's uh, words rang true. There was a lot of speculation as to where Pike's cantonment was from back to the Dr. Kellogg days, the other people who thought they had found it in other locations. Now we're pretty sure we know precisely where it was and where they forded the river and what was going on. But it's important, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, but it's important to commemorate these things, isn't it, Thomas? Oh, yes, sir. Um, Pike's cantonment. A lot of local collectors and historians knew pretty much generally where it was. Um, the Air Force definitely knew where it was when they put that flight line in. They, oh, yeah. They, they knew exactly where it was. But you have to consider the times. Was it more important to have a sack base built than a bunch of burned out old barracks and where a campground was? Um, it's, you know, it's a different time. The, the, the use of the base is, is in the past, and that recognition should be brought to the forefront. Um, it has been. The sign is out very, very close to where the site is. I know it. Don't you love it now? Yeah. You can you can spit and hit it. it it's, it's, it's good to see it. Um, I get I get excited because I go out. I'm, I'm the guy that throws the flags out there. Because I know. When the flags are gone, I put them up. Isn't it wonderful? Um, I'm glad to see it. it, it it's... And, it, and it's growing with, like I said, like Josh starting it, and we've got the Pru Militia guys. And because the Pru Militia, people think about them, and they don't think about them until like 1814, when th they're mentioned in journals in 1812 and 1813. They were they were pioneers. They were the guys cutting the wood and bringing it to the cantonment. And there's a lot written about that yeah. too. They they were they 
they built the roads to head north. There's, there's a lot of history out there that is recorded. I just have to know where to look for it. You know, uh, I opened my Plattsburgh Press Republican newspaper this morning, uh, and we're recording this on today's the 11th, right, of December 2010. And I saw a couple of um, announcements that pleased me. One of them was that we're going to have uh, an aeronautics firm, Laurentian Aeronautics, coming in here to move in a base, hire something like 900 people, build buildings, hire local people to work on these wide-bodied aircraft that will be coming in here over the next few years. And that will put us on the global map, and that's great. I also saw an announcement that there will be a tremendous push on to promote the history in this area far and wide by chambers of commerce and others. And isn't that a wonderful thing? After you and I have been promoting it, me even longer than you have, because you're a lot younger than me, and never could understand why people weren't flocking here from every state in the Union and foreign countries when I first learned how much history was underneath this where we're standing right now, Thomas. Oh, I know. So if we can spend some money, some advertising dollars, do some real marketing, promote this museum uh, campus out here, talk about the things that you love to talk about most, we'll get finally get camp people coming here for their vacations in the summertime and the fall. And won't that be wonderful? We, we were talking about it this morning. Some of the guys who are around the fire, where you know, just just within a few feet of where we stand, you can run from Native American history all the way up till you know World War One, easily. Um, and there's a, there's a connection. It, it, it's uh, it, it is amazing. And then like I'm sitting here, I know certain things, and then all of a sudden a guy will pop up with a bunch of stuff that I don't know because that's what he's more interested in. They say so you got the 1830 period, um, and they're talking about Ulysses S. Grant was here and Andrew Jackson, and and you just you go wow. <laughs> well, MacArthur was here, and a lot of people after that, Teddy Roosevelt made yeah. a number of appearances here during that uh, First World War era. But uh, uh, this, I call it hallowed ground because I believe it is, yeah, Thomas, where we're in, standing in, now, uh, has been yeah, continuously yeah, yeah. active militarily uh, they, uh, since even before they, our country was quick, born. And I know you are a self-proclaimed expert on Native uh, Americans uh, in this uh, area. Uh, and, uh, you know, anytime uh, somebody uh, tells uh, me uh, something, uh, oh, because uh, I write ghost stories, and they say, oh, where we are in this condo, this was an Indian burial ground. I said, you go talk to Tommy Prey. He'll tell you. He'll tell you where. Uh, how many arrowheads do you have? I took my. Not to mention all the other Native American. Let, let, let's just say thousands. Thousands, yeah. and weapons mm -hmm. of all kinds, and that's been a real huge passion of yours since early childhood, right? Since I was 11. Yeah. Now, that's a few years ago. So there. There were a lot of transient Native Americans up here that were moving around, weren't there? Well, yes. Er, er, early on, if, if you go way back, you, you, can, go, you can go back 12,000 years here, and you've got uh, you've got your paleos moving through, and, and, and people will say big game hunters were hunting like mastodons and woolly mammoths, which is which is quite possible, but for the most part, it was probably caribou and elk. Yeah. But then you run all the way all the way into the contact period. And unfortunately, what happens is historians later on, 19th century historians, will say when you, when the Americans came in into this area, that there were no natives. Well, of course there were no natives because they'd been pushed out and, and decimated by smallpox. But prior to that, just prior to contact period, there were a lot of Native Americans here. You can't walk into a field here and probably stick a spade in and not within a few feet find some evidence of Native American occupation. Isn't that wonderful? It's all over here. Yeah. So you're interested in all, all phases of uh, military history as well, aren't you? Too much. Too, now, uh, you say too much. Too much. Well, you know what? When I, say, when I use the word passion to apply to you and these other reenactors here, I wasn't kidding. Because once it gets in your blood, 
it doesn't go anywhere until you can act upon it one way or the so, other. How many uniforms do you have, Thomas? Seventeen. Oh, do you? <laughs> come on, do you 17. really? Yeah. Seventeen. Uh, yeah, we counted them in the barn the other day. There's like twenty-seven out there. Seventeen are mine. Oh my goodness! My kids have them, and. I but, I, but I think on the scale with some of these other guys, I'm, I'm probably not as high up on the scale with all the different activities. It's, it's truly amazing and, and a lot of fun. And Calvin and I have uh, visited all the forts within a couple hundred miles of where we are. We've interviewed reenactors from just about every state in the Union. And it's not something that's local here to the North Country. And I know you travel a little bit, even up into Canada, don't you, Thomas? Yes, we do. We've been, I've been up to St. Francis. But I tell you what, Quebec, and Montreal, we've done up through there. Last uh, year, been on Island Law. We go west as far as Niagara. Some people do this mostly only in the summertime and in the fall. Then you've got a <laughs> you've got a red coat ready for almost any occasion, don't you? I I find that my interest, like in this, is like right now. This is a fifth Northumberland. This is uh, War of 1812, 1814. These guys had were Wellington's bodyguards, and they came to Plattsburgh as part of Robinson's brigade. That's Nobody That's else is doing that. It's all so why not? You know? So it's like there's a new coat, but there's a new experience to show people. You know, they, they think all, all, all Brits wear red coats, which is quite possible, but you are all different units. So when you look at now at the Battle of Plattsburgh, you'll have like the third buffs that Josh does. You have the 17 in a skilling. And now I'm starting the, the 5th Northumberland. So there'll be a different, you know, a different vision. It, it, it's like, for me, I have the passion about the history, but I like to share the passion. You know, it's like for, with children. When I see a, a child get it, when you tell them a story. Isn't it wonderful? Yes. That, that's, it's like people say I should have been a teacher. Uh, but I like doing it this You're teaching every time you flap your lips yeah. and you know it. Yeah. You're teaching right here because most of the people watching this on Hometown Cable or on the internet at Plattsburgh.com or Hometown Cable Network. Dot com uh, may not be uh, as interested as you are. They certainly are not as knowledgeable as you are. But if we open the door, maybe they'll stick a foot in it. Maybe they'll come to some more of these reenactments. Now, obviously, it's a cool day, but you know it's in the mid-30s today. And it was probably a lot colder some of those nights when the guys were trying to hunker down before they got those those log huts built, right? Uh, extremely cold. So that's why we're commemorating these times because our our ancestors, American, Canadian, British ancestors, Native American Indians, back to the other times, that were through some hard times to get us where we are today. We look at Pike's Cantonment, and like Josh was talking about earlier, about 200 men died out there. Um, I've looked through all the regiment accounts of when they arrived here and then when they left here and went to York. And, and you, you find about 10 or 15 men or names missing from, from each company, and that amounts to about 190 so you're in that 200 range, but what we've, During we, we fail to realize is at the same time, disease was running rampant in Plattsburgh, and just as many civilians died over that winter, you know, it, was, it was harsh for everybody. We didn't have antibiotics back in those days. All we have to do is look at the old uh, barrack cemetery here. Hundreds died over And hundreds died there, and then... And in the influenza yeah, epidemic, I mean, we had cholera. After the First World War, uh, yeah. we had cholera. People think cholera is an odd thing now when they see all the people that died in Haiti. Guess what, folks? There, there's a cemetery out by um, Willsboro, and I would say that probably 90% of the, the stones in it are from the 1840 yeah, cholera epidemic. You know. And it, it was, uh, you know, there were little kids, there were mothers and grandmothers, and you know what kills me is to look at those cemeteries and see all the tiny babies that died and so on and so forth so it's important to to commemorate these events to have an encampment a small encampment like this and over a two-day period now we're doing this on the 11th you had a little skirmish didn't you at one o'clock how did that go today it actually went pretty good um we had as i was talking about earlier you had all that skirmishing and that patrolling uh, along the border, as, as uh, Josh said about 
um, that Colonel Pike had sent out the proclamation. You had smuggling was rampant. Oh yeah. You know, because I mean, you could make a buck. The British paid the best, and um, they had been trading all along prior to the war, and, and nobody in New York voted for this bo this war. Are you going right? You know, they didn't the want it. Yeah. Neither did the Vermonters or okay. New Hampshire. Be dressed like that. Oh yes. <laughs> I've done worse than this. So here we are. Coming back. Here we are. Okay. All those years later, commemorating this, and maybe just maybe the spirits of those people who were camped around Pike's Cantonment are looking down on us today, Thomas. I, I drove by there this morning coming here. Did you really? Yeah. You, how can you, get here. How can it not be on your mind from time to time? It's always on my mind when I go around that corner. Mine too. <laughs> we're going to talk to some other people. Thanks, Thomas. Yes, Thank you. Uh, Greg Russell, what are you making here? A uh, rifle bag. For, really? For uh, shooting implements. Actually, the the gentleman that's to my right, Charlie Mitchell, his father bought a Pennsylvania rifle. And he emails me, says, asking about a, a bag. So I says, we'll just have to make him one. Yeah, like yeah, You are amazing. You are amazing. Charlie! Yeah. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Good Thanks. to see you. How are your parents doing? Very good, thank you. Thank I'm you. so glad to hear that. Yeah. We go back a little ways, Charlie. No? I know. Uh, yeah. Some of those things we'll remember and some <laughs> things we can't. Well, I just, it's funny, I just uh, pulled out, I gave a talk at an English class yesterday on your sports lifestyle thing, and I pulled out a picture, <laughs> and it had Greg and Gordy and me, uh, all, you know, Bantam, it was our Bantam hockey team, <laughs> and Dave Matt and, and so on, and, and I have uh, um, uh, Craig's, uh, Greg's nephew in class, I said, check this out, here's your uncle. Isn't that and, uh, he's like, hey, look, he's got long hair. <laughs> <laughs> I was telling somebody via email, here we are, bringing the past right up to the present in a manner of speaking. Because right, right. we had Kay and I had five yeah. kids playing hockey at one yeah, yeah, time yeah, later yeah. In the, oh, yeah. after wow. you guys left. Oh, and yeah, I was wow. talking on Skype with our youngest son, Kirk, uh -huh. today. Uh -huh. And, of course, he played hockey here and at Brown University and so uh, yeah. on. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah. So that's great. So, you, so you're making a... You're making. You're not calling it a sling. Now. What are you calling it? It's a it's a rifle bag. Rifle bag. It's gonna. It's going to. I guess Charlie's father has the rifle on his uh, mantle. Right, right. So this could hang with it. Look but when this. it gets done, this this will be turned under, and this becomes part of the bag itself. Oh. And it's got a little pocket for little accessories. So what did you use for a template or a... I made the pattern. I should have known. I made a pattern for I should have known you did. <laughs> we just, uh... I'll have to admit the first the first thing I made with this, I required just a little bit of, uh... of alteration. Oh, you did? Yeah, it, it wasn't good the first time. Uh, but... Actually, Lynn Wilkie has a bag made out of the same pattern. Oh, he does! No he kidding. Carries, that he carries on the at the Battle of Plattsburgh. Oh, so I didn't know if done. Lynn would make it with his Peru contingent today or not. Oh, uh, there's two of them here. Oh, I know there are two here. I'm going to walk over here. I'll probably yeah. fall down walking well, around here. <laughs> Craig, but before I leave you, Craig, yes. tell me a little bit about your interest in your interest in history and reenacting and how you got involved. Well, I was a kid. I was back back in second grade. I went to a place called the Phillipsburg Manor in um, in the Hudson Valley. Don't you love it? It was a school it was a school trip. And we were at the ferry house and that's where my ancestors landed today, in seventeen ninety seven. All right. It's History just abounds uh, in New York State. Yeah. Uh, you don't you can't go anywhere without having some something that happened in the past that's totally um, engrossing, totally interesting. Well, I'm watching these these ladies in period dress um, interact with each other in the ferry house. And at that point, I'm only in second grade, it make me about seven years old. And I said, one of these days, I want to do this. And is not that something? And it, I mean, that's how that's how much of an impression it was for me. 
And uh, through the years and so forth, the reason for learning how to make things is because I just like to do hands-on things. And we all know how long winters can be up here. And uh, so, you want all the way the time making di different things. If I if I want a cartridge box for myself, I'll make if I if I get if I get a, a good idea of what it looks like, um, I'll make it for myself, save some money. Also, do you feel, and I'm sure you do, uh, this is a foregone conclusion that you're going to feel closer to the actual history by reenacting it? Oh yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, there's some realism. Uh, there's also, um, I brought it up last night, we were at, uh, at um, a, uh, an event last night that was actually opening up um, a lot of opportunities for living history. At the same point, the big thing is bringing people, attracting people to the area. I heard you talking to um, uh, Tom about this. Uh, I agree with you. When I came to Plattsburgh State in 1969, I was sitting down at the uh, Champlain Monument with a, a couple of my friends from Yonkers, that's where I'm from, and we were saying how dead everything was, how there's just so much that went on historically, and it doesn't, nobody capitalizes on it. This is back in 1969. If you do the math, you're talking like 40 years ago. And uh, I think we've come a long way in increments since, I guess, 12, 13 years ago when we started to do the Battle of Plattsburgh. I remember we were at the Kent the Lord House um, when we really initiated this 13 years ago. Uh, you were there. You were there with Calvin, and we were. Uh, it just it, that particular weekend that we did just took the whole area by storm, saying, "Hey, this is a good idea." And look where we are today. It's amazing. And, and I can't, you know, we get a little impatient because Tommy said we like to share our information. Yeah. You guys are real students of all of this stuff. <laughs> always like learning. To, always learning, learning every day. And, you know, we're, we're discovering new archives. New and just sitting down and chatting with people, uh, you learn what, what their own interests are. New information. And you develop a, a mental compendium of information about history, and it, history goes far beyond the scope of this encampment here today, but this is a good start, and if we can engender an interest in places like Oshkosh and Cucamonga, my favorite places to say, not to, not to mention Peasleyville. <laughs> Peasleyville. Higher on my list. Yes. So you brought up Phillipsburg Manor. Yes. And uh, I love to tell, and my mother is shining, smiling down on me, because her French Huguenot ancestors by the name of Requa, R-E-Q-U-A, three brothers came over here in 1797 and settled around what we now call Sleepy Hollow. Sure. And Phillipsburg Manor was a part of the whole thing. And so my ancestors are an integral part of the history down there. And when you go down there and talk about it, that it, it pleases me, especially when you have your roots there, you know? Yep. I used to go to the um, Phillips Manor, which is in Gettys, um, Getty Square, Yonkers, in the midst of Otis Elevator, the uh, Yonkers train station. And there sits this brick house, the Phillips Manor. And I used to go there, and um, there was a, an older gentleman. He was disabled. He had had a stroke, and he had worked for Otis Elevator. Mr. Bauer was his name. And he, uh, he was more or less the caretaker, we, that's what we called it, of uh, the Manor House. And I used to go down there. Well, I was old enough to where I was trusted to go downtown and so forth on my own. And I used to go up, used to let me go upstairs to the attic where nobody, nobody went. Oh, oh. old Charlottesville musket. I'm getting there. interested. Old I love it. Musket up there. And I used to, I picked that up. I'd pick up the musket and stand at the window. And they were all that lazy glass, old glass. Oh, yes. And I'd be looking outside saying to myself, if I could, uh, if I could take the parking lot away and so forth, and now I'm looking at I'm looking at field and so forth, and uh, here I am. Uh, 
back in the uh, early 1700s. Oh gosh. His, he used to, every time I'd, I'd show up, he'd give me the high sign and I'd scoot up the stairs up to the attic. And there were, there were our archives, there were old records, things I was able to look into, um, read and so forth. And it was just, it was just uh, great. So here you are all these years later. Still doing this stuff. Still doing this stuff and you will be right to your last breath. Just about. Probably you, probably will be my last breath. Don't, don't you love it? <laughs> what, what, you know what I say? What a way to go. go. Craig, thanks so much. Thanks. Have a wonderful weekend. You too. All right. Hi guys, how are you? Hi Gordy, how are you? Tell me who you are. I'm Patsy Dodge. And? John Dodge. I knew that, John. <laughs> we had Jim Brown. Isn't this fun? Oh, it's a lot of fun. We uh, come involved. Of course, we're, 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 I took over from uh, Lynn Wilkie for the Peru Militia. And uh, uh, we've got with Craig, and we've done a lot of interesting things, the French Indian War, and a lot, all this other stuff. And we decided to come and participate in this. I can remember when that was uh, that Peru Militia was just a dream for these reenactments. And here you are. You have a sizable group of people who are not afraid to dress up. Don't we all love to dress up? We all love to dress up, Gordy, and we all like to shoot muskets. So I guess it comes in just a lot of fun. You shoot muskets and I shoot the bull. Right? <laughs> and I've killed, lo I've killed lots of them over the, over the years. How big is the group now, John? Our militia is about six or seven uh, full-time members, and we have other people trying to get in. Uh, you know, it's hard to get people involved, but uh, more and more people are doing it every, every year, and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, it's nice to find people who can uh, make the commitment, because there is a commitment of time and energy and money, because uh, unless you can make all your own costumes, you're talking bucks here if you want to be, be authentic at all, aren't you? We're talking a musket that's going to cost you $1,000. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a major investment, but if you take care of it, it's going to last a long, long time. So that's just part of it. Just part of it. So you, have you always done it as a team? Well, actually, when we st I did it for a few years with, with Lynn, and uh, we just did it like he did two days a year. But uh, ever since we started going a little bit uh, farther and doing more things like the French Indian War, uh, my wife Patricia has come along with me, thank goodness, because she keeps me out of trouble many times. And <laughs> don't they have a lot of things that I how don't do. How do they manage? I have no However idea. I think I'm where I would be if I'm, it weren't I'm for I'm glad Craig. to have her with her sometimes. <laughs> I forget so much, I'll tell you. Are they a lovely couple? Have, have you tried any, any uh, historic recipes? No, not yet. No. That's kind of fun. You know, people drag out the ancient. My wife loves cookbooks. Of course, raising 15 kids, she knew how to <laughs> she knew how to stretch sure. that ham bone, if you oh, know what yeah. I mean. Yep. Well, she's kind of, uh, but she's, she's kind got of, uh, some of the old ones. She's kind of being uh, modest because she does she bakes these handmade rolls for Christmas and oh, for Thanksgiving, oh, and oh, she does oh, all the pies oh, and all that things. But oh, of course, she wouldn't say that to you. Gordon. Homemade rolls, come on. <laughs> oh yes. Seriously. The yes. weight of my oh, stomach. The weight. Of, <laughs> you don't have to start at my heart or my ears or anywhere. <laughs> Just, uh, it's, most, it's most men, Gordy. If they, if you like them and they can cook good, oh my gosh, you're hooked. I was just looking at a magazine the other day that comes to my house <laughs> that I pick up from time to time, called Country Magazine. Mm -hmm. There are others like it, where people just tell stories <laughs> of what what it was like at Christmas time, 80, 90 years ago. What it was like when their grandparents were. But that's what reenacting is all about. And you don't just. Uh, it's not like little kids putting on their, their grandfather's uh, jeans to make them believe that he's a farmer. You have to study it. And if you don't understand what you're doing or why you're doing it, then it takes a lot of the pleasure away, doesn't it, John? Yes, it does. It um, When we started thinking about going to the Cotoman, of course, uh, Craig has been doing this for years. These boys have been doing it for years. And we thought we'd get interested. And we're, well, we were... I, I've got the new book in the uh, museum about the War of 1812 has been republished after so many years. And did you ever see the blanket that those guys were issued? Isn't it amazing? You just showed me that blanket a few minutes ago when we started. Can you, can you imagine? No, I can't. Monday night. Don't burn like it up in the fire, John. Okay, I will. But think about it. Isn't that something? It's wool. It's wool. Yeah. We're supposed to weigh a pound and a quarter. Uh, yeah. Uh, General Pike put it in an envelope and sent it to Washington to show them what they were getting for their money. 
They said he never got a response back, so I guess it was... Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and I joked when you first held it up when I was over there that it wouldn't cover one-third of this opulent frame of mine. It covers, it covers Patricia's mine. shoulders pretty Does well, it? but not Is mine. That's good? <laughs> yes. Well, I don't know how we would survive no. these, even these modern North Country winners if I didn't have my little blankie at night. Oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> would have my wife and I look across the room and chuckle at each other as we get under our little blankie. You know, honey, throw another log in the wood stove. Yeah. Please, you know? Those guys are out in the middle of, of the, of the, of the this, the winter they had was pretty severe, I guess. And they, they suffered a lot. A lot of them died. When you listen to the uh, description that uh, Tommy and, and all these people give about what life was like back then, those were tough times. Yes, At the best, they were tough times. Yes. Because even if you had money, you couldn't resist the disease that was rampant through this area very often. And another uh, interesting point he brought up in that uh, in the book was if the guy, if a man got sick and he was feeling bored, they used to bleed him, of course. And some some of them were reported 16 ounces of blood. Yeah. Out of this poor guy, I mean, can you imagine that losing yeah. losing a quart of blood? Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> some of the medical techniques back then. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I I've seen those saws that they used oh, to remove God. limbs. <laughs> and we didn't have very good anesthesia back in those days <laughs> no. either, so thank you, no, I'll stay the way with it. No. Yes. Re Reenacting has its advantages, I guess. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is, is it that he never lets you talk or that you just... I'm shy. I love it. <laughs> yeah, you, you believe it. So if things go wrong in the kitchen, then it's a different ball game, oh right? That's right. Thank you, guys. So much for being here. Packers. And bread. Oh, a little bread and cheese. Hi, who are you? Tom Beck. Tom, how are you? Cold. You can talk with your mouth full. Soldiers don't have to don't have to stop chewing well, to talk. Not a soldier today. I'm a smuggler. Oh, you're a smuggler. That's uh, even better. I'd like to put it as a um, an entrepreneur. <laughs> That's what these smugglers were, entrepreneurs, and believe me, they got paid pretty well for for doing what they did. Well, the people here in New York didn't want to start a fight or a war. We actually voted all against it. People down south, in the lower states, were the ones that were for the war because we were trading with our neighbors in Canada. And uh, just trying to get by. Mouths to feed, you know? Yeah, you got it, baby. In the winter and... Yeah, yeah. So There's nothing wrong with a little bit of enterprise. You got that. Well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? Well, originally from New York City. Oh, no kidding. I came up here the with the Air Base. You still got the accent. Yes, yeah, the accent. I love it. And uh, got here in 1970. Been here yeah, yeah, for, yeah. Yeah. well, almost ever since I left and came back because it was a nice way of life. And, you know, uh, you I've know. been the manager of Pearl Vision Center for like 20 years. And uh, we've since moved from the old location uh, in the Ames Plaza, and there's no more buildings, uh, no more businesses there, and moved in behind um, Stewart's in the old Little Caesars building. And now we call ourselves North Country Optical. All right. Same Dr. Lack and same staff. I, I love it. I got a day off today, and this is how I'm spending it. So you, when did you start reenacting? Uh, John hooked me up. Uh, <laughs> well, John knows how to do that. John knows how to he knows that. how to hook me up. John and I go back 30 years. We worked together when it was called Northland Optical in the uh, Ames oh, Plaza. I, I remember. I remember. Long time ago. Did I go back farther than all of you put together? <laughs> <laughs> I remember all of it. Well, John and I were old timers, and that's why we have that flag. That's the exemptor flag. That's people who had fought in the Revolutionary War, and they were exempt from fighting in this war. Yeah. But they came out and they fought for their country and they fought on the flag of the exemptors. So they didn't have to but they could, but they did. When did you first heard hear when did you first hear the word reenacting? Can you remember? Oh no, my daughter was in it for a lot of years. Oh she was? Yes. And um, been doing it. John I knew was in at it was at it. Um, I had a gentleman who worked for me who actually drew that Battle of Plattsburgh uh, map. You know, you see hanging around uh, sure. the artist work on it. So, and I, I have the original he had left with me, and uh, so it just went to the timeline, the military timeline they had on uh, Memorial Day here. I know, isn't it? Wasn't it? Fun? It was very nice. It is they, every they, year. Good job. They went from uh, from a Spanish conquistador to oh, yeah. who was in the Air, uh, Air Force as a uh, FB 111 pilot. So, and. John was doing uh, a, a trooper, right? Spanish American War trooper. Yep. And uh, he said, "Come on back, Tom." He just and he hooked me into it. I've been hooked since then. There you are. 
He says, we need help in the Peru militia. We need to fill the ranks. So. Oh, you got it. And I'd love to see him in the parade every every time. I forgot to ask John how many there are in the militia now. Did I ask you, John? I'd say about seven full-time members. <clears throat> and we're yep. growing. We have a couple on the line. <laughs> we're, we're trying to get more and more people. It just, it just I, takes time. I think that's great. Now, who's your neighbor over there? I'm Chris Heckard. Hi, Chris. Hi. How, how are you? Good. How Good. long have you known these guys? Um, this morning. <laughs> uh, Josh, I work with Josh Wingler uh, at the county jail, and he talked to me and talked to me and talked to me, and, as he usually does. And, uh, oh, yeah. I taught him everything he knows. Yeah, how to I, flat can, those I, can, I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> and um, he's, he says, since you like history so much, why don't you come on down and try the reenacting part? And that was about a week ago, so here I am. So this is the first... Event? My first reenactment. Yep. I love it. Yep. Well, it's about time we captured this. How did you uh, engender that uh, interest in history? How did that start? Um, I had always been interested in American history, and then I've been in Plattsburgh all my life, and I was very interested in um, especially the, uh, the Battle of 1812 with the naval part of it for some strange reason, although I'd never been on a ship. On a naval ship. Who knows? Before. Maybe you reincarnated from one of those who cool knows, guys. Who knows? But I've been I've been interested in all that, and uh, I read all kinds of history books. And like I said, here I am. <laughs> you know, it's I've uh, interviewed, as you can imagine, literally thousands of reenactors and other people who are history teachers, professors, and it never ceases to amaze me how involved the reenactors become. Oh, yeah. And as I mentioned earlier in our program with John and the others, it's not just a matter of putting on that cool black hat of yours nope. and doing the thing. You really have to feel the part. Yes. And, yes. and I've talked to reenactors at serious reenactments all over the country who will not step out of that persona, who will not tell you what their real name is now or where they're from. I've talked, we've talked to Native American, uh, Tommy plays over there, but we've talked to Native American reenactors who have learned the ancient Native language. Wow. Who, who uh, brought all their kids up reenacting. I've met people with five or six kids in a family who go to every reenactment they can. That, that would be a luxury. Who has enough money to go hey, to? But Jesus yeah, Crow, I know some ancient language here, me too. You know? Well, you know, <laughs> I, Why yes? I should have I should have brought the original <laughs> the original cap that I have that called when Clyde Rabideau was mayor of the city of Plattsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> and and Jesus Why, Crow was Jesus the, Crow, you know. Crow was Jesus the guys, what they doing here sitting well, here by this fire them, eh? Jesus um, Crow was the yeah. mascot. I've been there, me you. Uh, it sure was. Yeah, it sure was. You know, and, and the funny there. from West Jay Z there, eh? You know, there now you I want you to think about this. <laughs> there are people watching this program who've never been to Plattsburgh, uh -huh. who've never seen Seen a Jesus crow flying low overhead. <laughs> yes, it's the rarest bird in North Carolina. Oh, it's a, and they're just they're, they're beautiful creatures <laughs> in an ugly so kind of way. Great fortune will become will come to you if the yep. Jesus crow yep. on your head. <laughs> we, was told, we was told us if we stayed the night here, we'd see a Jesus crow. Yeah, if, if and Clyde, if we drink enough rum, we might see one too. You know, quite heard by the talking, he's I've been laughing. turning my head and looking because I've been hearing a lot of people going Jesus crow. So the yes. I haven't seen it yet. And the benefit of this, you see one, you. Hey, yeah. some crow. Yeah. Yeah. The benefit of those people who are watching this who have no idea what nomenclature, what ancient or gonna, modern you're language you're we're really talking. This on, you? This, you, this doesn't get edited. This is the way it goes. So you're, you're the Jesus crow of the moment here. Right, the Jesus, I know. But it, you know, we all have. Uh, let's say every area of the country has its idiosyncratic speech patterns yes, they do. and here in the north country we have our own and we're not belittling people no. who live in certain parts of the north country we're relishing and cherishing all that localized speech as they say you guys Use guys, use guys, use guys. I love it. Especially if you're from the Tri City area. I know, yes. Supposedly. Yeah, supposedly. Don't you love it? Supposedly. How do you spell that? You know, where's the B come in? You wonder how much of this. Have if you guys ever spend any time in the mountains of West Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, Kentucky? Yeah. 
And I didn't know what a holler was until my mother and father moved down there. My sister lives there. Yeah. A holler is where the two mountains come along the side. Yeah. Yeah. And when you yell, it that goes all the way up. People that's live, what they call it a holler. Families, they yeah. holler up the mountains. Yeah, they holler up yeah. the mountains. Yeah. Exactly. The whole families will live in a holler. Yeah. You know, and, and actually, that's if you where the, red, the true redneck came from. Yeah. People don't understand that. During the coal mine strike, when they brought in people from the cities to work as security, the coal miners put these red scarfs on the neck so they knew who the miners were. Absolutely. And that's where the redneck How came many from. people knew that before you just said that? I don't know. <laughs> I I know. But that's funny, is a, a boy from Brooklyn knows about the, red, the true redneck. No, you didn't live in, a lot of, res you lot of respect for the people You didn't live in Stuyvesant, in, in, in Stuyvesant section, did you? No, uh, Canarsie. <laughs> well, that's even better, Canarsie. Oh, I love it. Well, it just goes to show you that people from all persuasions and all walks of life become reenactors. It's a fun thing to do. It's a little better when it's warm. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's a little, I, I was a little more, more comfortable. Yeah. It's warm. <laughs> and now, how many? I wonder how many guys are going to stay the night tonight. Uh, three so, three so far. Hey, you get all choked up just talking about yeah, it. Don't you? I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> swallow, swallow. Three, three, three so far. John, who's staying overnight? Uh, I think Josh is. Tom and, Prey. Uh, Tom Prey. And and Josh, and Josh, three gentlemen right there. And you are Charlie. Oh, you are the tiger. <laughs> you are the tiger. Andy Freeze. I love it. <laughs> you guys, you guys are the best. That's why. I want to thank you all for thank you. chatting thank with you. me today and for doing this reenacting. It means a lot to me personally, as I mentioned to Tommy Prey. When I first came here to go on the radio after graduating from a school on Long Island, I found out that this place uh, was uh, steeped in history. The moment I came to town, always having had an interest in the history of my own family and places where I live, and for now, if you can believe it, almost 50 years, I would, any chance I got on a street corner, on the radio, now on television or in the newspaper, talk about this glorious history, the great people we have here in the North Country, as is evidenced by the group we have here today, and our quality of life, which almost saved the air base, right? Yeah. The, the first time around and almost the second time around. Yeah. But we have a special yeah. part of the country here. And this group is uh, personifies, I think, what that, that uh, essence of the North Country is all about. For all those years, I promoted the history, wondering why the rest of the world you know, why was Plattsburgh Shh, and Clinton County the, the best well-kept <laughs> secret in the world, John? On this Air Force base right here, Teddy Roosevelt came, General MacArthur was here. There were so many fantastic things that happened here, and people just don't know. Yeah. Ulysses, 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 Ulysses S. Grant was here. Oh, U.S. Grant was here. He always spoke well of you. We need to give people... <laughs> we need to give people... We need to somehow get people to care about it again. You know, that's one yeah. of the things we'd like to try to do. And, one thing that living history does is it it allows us to get that message out and hopefully people are going to want to find out and they are going to care and they're going to see how much fun it is to do this. It really we said it over and over again today, Tommy Prey and Josh and everybody else and Craig, if we can get the kids interested in it, right. if we can get the kids pulling at their mother's yeah. their dad's shirt tail saying we want to go to Plattsburgh right. for the Charlie, Battle of Plattsburgh reenactment. They're always down in all these encampments and and reenactments and it's just fantastic to see. I love, nothing yeah. pleases me more like when we went up to Point Affair and they yeah, had yeah. the reenactments right. to see the little kids running yeah. back and forth. I said, yeah. where are you going? Well, my dad told me I ought to tell those people over there that yeah. somebody's over here and they've got their guns. And well, my, my, uh, my granddaughter was uh, held on our side for the crew militia in the parade this year. Did she really? And I hope that my other granddaughter will be there next year. I love it's it. It's fun to see. You know how much fun those kids no, had at really no, Crown Point? Point. Oh, yeah. my God. They never stopped. Oh, yeah. These kids are running all over the place, and that's one of the things that th they had was an old fort to play in. Yeah. That's the one thing nice about Crown Point is they could go anywhere. Yeah, it's you not know? the best. And you know, if you had some place like that in Plaster, you could open up and let just kids go and have fun. When I you know, read the, the old fort in Mouse's Point, and oh, they could go Charlie, and do something like Charlie, that. Charlie, Charlie, when I read the paper this morning and saw yep, I did tell them about some of the dreams of people about yeah, yeah, promoting yeah, the history, yeah, yeah. and they talked about 
I mean, years ago, I used to stand out there at the Old Stone Barracks, not more than 300 yards from where we are right now, and say, wouldn't it be great if we had a full-size replica of the Saratoga? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right here. Right. When they open up this museum campus, we can bring people down and take a tour of the Saratoga. Yeah. Last night when she said that, the oh, woman said, we are going to build the fleet again. Build and the fleet. And people were just like, even, you know, listen, even if it do, that doesn't happen in its entirety, just for a moment, everybody was like, I was yes. so excited. It was like everybody at the same time I was, was like, so excited. Yes. Build, yes. a, build a pond down by where the crate center is, by yeah. the by the city beach as we call it, yeah. and and put put replicas yep. of of the fleet. Right, right. You know, I did a uh, as long as we're on the subject, I can talk about doing a uh, television show with Calvin Cassine for Hometown Cable at the CVPH Wellness Center which is uh, on the former new base across the road from here, the old rec center. Yep. You know, the beautiful facilities there. I'm a, I'm a member myself. And, and, and people, and, and we were talking about history while we were there. Right. And I was remembering spending time out there during the first Gulf War, staying awake for almost, well, I guess three whole days interviewing troops as they were coming back through, because this was a clearinghouse. They were stopping here and going home and enjoying the, that part of the history. I was remembering working on construction crews and pouring cement all over this, the base on both sides of the, both sides of the road for various buildings, including the Oak Club, which doesn't even exist anymore. And, and now here we are remembering history that's way, way older than that. <laughs> yes. But ain't it fun? Yes, it is. It's a lot of fun. So, you know, Gordy, you know, we're talking about the, uh, I know from the uh, Battle of Plattsburgh Association that we've lost our funding to try to get the bar stone barracks that's here. I know. And, you know, that is such a fantastic place. Save our barracks. That's what we should be talking about. Save our barracks and save our history. We, we need to do something. Yeah, we well, of course, Keith Herkelo is one of my dearest friends in the whole world, and he and I commiserate about things like that. That stone barracks is one of... One of my favorite places in the whole world. Oh, it's so fantastic. Look at it. Just go out and look. And you know, and look at it. It's just fantastic. And someday that will happen. I hope. No I matter hope what. Gosh, it does. When our economy improves, someday people will realize how important it is to preserve that yes. and open it up and make that dream. Won't that be a wonderful oh, dream I, come I, true? Sometimes my wife and I come down on a summer summer afternoon and we have dinner and we watch the sun go down and you just feel just just the people that have stood on those barracks. Think and about it. And see the same sunset. And we just have a little picnic and just... You know, it catches my breath every night when I drive by and see the lights on the building. When we do the Haunted Haunts bus tours we did mm -hmm. for the last few years. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the third annual encampment, and I hope there are lots more. And even though it was open to the public, the only way most of the public is going to see this encampment <laughs> is through the eyes of this camera right here for Hometown Cable. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Gordy. Thanks for coming. Have a wonderful weekend, and thank you for your passion for history. Well, we've just about killed an hour talking about the Pikes Cantonment reenactment. I thought it would be appropriate for me to walk over just a few steps to the Clyde A. Lewis Park, which moved to this side of the road after the base hospital was moved and a bank came into the intersection. We're right near that famous or infamous rotary on the south end of Plattsburgh, right next to the U.S. Air Force prior to the Adirondacks. And for those people who were stationed here who, or who lived in the greater Plattsburgh area, you might remember the famous Santa Claus astride the plane for many, many years. And uh, ultimately, he was taken down after the base closed, and by popular demand, he wasn't retired. He was brought out of retirement again and came here, and we're delighted for that. I wanted to just show you a picture of the stone barracks past the engines of the aircraft. We talked about those old stone barracks and how these reenactors and Keith Herkelo, president of the Battle of Plattsburgh Association, had a dream and still have it of this wonderful old early 1800s building being restored and used to preserve the history of this north country and right past that is our fabulous Lake Champlain the old base or the Barrett Cemetery is off in that direction 
I want to thank everybody for watching this program. Primarily, I want to thank the people who dig deep into their wallets to support Hometown Cable. Uh, without those contributions, this program can't continue too far into the future. I hope you're able to watch this program either on the local cable systems in the North Country or via the internet at Hometown Cable hometowncablenetwork.com and at plattsburgh.com you can watch the program at your leisure and tell your friends about it as well in the meantime uh, as we're recording this in the holiday season on December 11th 2010 we wish everybody the best of everything wherever you are whatever you're doing have a happy holiday period a happy whatever season it is at your house and don't ever forget the history that brings us here today. And as I like to say, who knows where we're going to be next time for our little corner. <laughs>